Okay, so we have talked about the static memory management uh, where the memory is, is allocated into a fixed area. Now we'll talk about dynamic memory management, in particular using stacks. Okay, so <clears throat> notice that uh, when blocks are entered and they are uh, left, when they're finished, uh, we're using uh, LIFO, we're using last in, first out. So for example, when a block A is entered um, and then a block B is entered, we have to leave B before leaving A. So for example, in this case here, block A is entered, it has uh, local declarations of two variables, then we enter block B, and before we uh, enter, uh, before we exit A, we have to exit B first. So B uh, finishes, and then we continue with A, and then we exit A. So it's last in, first out. B is last in, and B is first out. Um, and therefore, it doesn't come as a surprise, as you recall, a LIFO mechanism is really, um, or we can say a stack, is very appropriate for implementing or simulating a LIFO mechanism. So that's the reason why we use a stack, uh, which is called the runtime stack, to manage the memory space required, required to store the information which are local to each block. And notice in this particular particular example, we have local information. We have local variables like int c and int b, which are declared in block b. And once block b has uh, finished execution, the the two local variables go out of scope. They are not live anymore. They are not accessible outside the block itself. And the same holds for the local variables that are declared in block A. So this is really the situation that we have in this example program. Uh, so if we go back, block A starts executing and it, memory for <coughs> the local variables A and, e, A and B needs to be allocated. And this is allocated, we can think of it as being allocated using uh, an activation record, which stores the information that is local to the block. So on the runtime stack, we have an acti activation record for uh, the block A, and it contains uh, memory space for the local variable B and the local variable A. Now what happens next is that the, the block B starts executing and that means it needs to be pushed onto the stack. And what does B include? It contains local information for the variables B, C and B. So and this can be seen in the second figure here that B and C are on the stack. The activation record for uh, block B has been pushed on the stack and it contains the variables B and C. And notice, and this is important, that the activation record for A is still on the stack. Uh, because the uh, block, block A has not finished execution. Block A starts ex executing, then uh, the, uh, the inner block B starts executing, and once B has finished, A is still executing. So A needs to be on the stack. The activation record for A needs to be on the stack still. And notice in this example that the, the stack is actually growing uh, downwards. The activation record for B is the top activation record on the stack. So I've mentioned here in this lecture this term activation record, uh, and I've actually specified uh, what it is, but here we, we have really the first slide that defines it. What's an activation record? It's the memory space allocated on the runtime stack, which is dedicated 
to an inline block or to an activation of a procedure. It's a memory space that's allocated on the runtime stack. And it contains an information that is associated with an inline block or to an activation of a procedure. So in this case, we have, in this example here, we have been talking about uh, uh, activation records that are associated with inline blocks. Those are inline blocks. But it is also associated with the activation of a procedure. Um, and notice that it's, a, it's associated with a specific activation of a procedure. One that is created when the procedure is called. So when we call a, a, a function or procedure f, then an activation record for f is cr created on the runtime stack. Now if f calls itself um, recursively, then another activation record of f will be pushed onto the runtime stack. So if we go back to an earlier example that we had, then when the main program here calls f, then an activation record for f is pushed onto the, to the runtime stack. Uh, once f finishes execution, the activation record for, for f is popped off the stack. Then later when it's called again, then the same thing happens. F is, the activation record for f is pushed onto the stack. And when it ends, it's popped off again. And notice that if f calls itself, uh, right, I guess I should have a parameter here since we have a local, uh, uh, a formal parameter in the function. But if f calls itself here, then the original activation record for f is, is still running. It has not finished. So at that point, we have two activation records for f on the runtime stack. The one that is coming from this or original call and the second one that uh, results from the activation, from the self-activation of f uh, when it calls itself recursively. And here we can see why if the, if the language uh, allows recursion, why we need to have, why we cannot uh, allocate the memory statically, because if we allocate the memory statically, we only have a single copy of the activation record. But in this case, we have two copies of the activation records on, on the stack. We need to have two copies because, for example, we have two copies of the uh, formal parameter and we have two copies of the local variable. So the runtime stack is the stack on which activation records uh, are stored. Now if we have inline blocks, and notice here we're not talking about uh, procedures or functions at, it, at, this, at this point, we're just talking about inline blocks. What do we need to keep in the activation records? Well, we need to keep the local variables, we need to keep intermediate results, and we need to keep something that's called a dynamic chain pointer. So if we have a look at these uh, each of these in, in more detail. And let's start with the intermediate results. And this is actually something that we talked about earlier. It can be necessary to store intermediate results even if the programmer does not assign explicit name to them. So for example in an expression like this, b is equal to a plus x divided by x plus y, then the result of a plus x must be computed, the result of x plus y must be computed, this will give rise to two temporary variables and then in order to compute the final value of b we say uh, the first temporary variable divided by the second temporary variable or the values of the tempor temporary variables uh, will give us the value b here. So even though we have as programmers not given names to these temporary variables that's something that the compiler has to uh, worry about. So the compiler basically generates these temporary variables. And if we come to, if blocks are executed, then we might imagine, for example, inside this block B here, that some temporary variable is created and it must be then kept in the activation record for this block B here. 
Now, local variables, if they are declared inside blocks, they may they must be stored in the memory space. Uh, and the the memory space has different sizes between blocks because we have may have a different number of local variables and we have different types of the variables. And uh, this is uh, something that the compiler can figure out. It can figure out what is the how many are the local variables and what are the types of the variables. Given that we have we are looking at a, a language that has uh, static static typing, meaning that the type of the variables can be um, uh, can be uh, figured out at compile time. So it's not a dynamically typed uh, language that we're talking about here. Uh, and if the given that the compiler can figure out the number of the local variables and the types of each variable, then it will be able to determine the size of this part of the of the activation record. It can also determine the size of the intermediate results, uh, the size for the intermediate results, because it, it the compiler is the one that generates the temporary variables. So it can figure out how, ma how many of them it needs. And then the third part here is what's called the dynamic chain pointer. And this is really just a pointer to the previous activation record on the stack. And we saw in our picture here and we didn't really talk about it, that's this pointer here. This is the dynamic pointer that points from the uh, from a, a particular activation record to the previous activation record on the stack. And why do we need this? Well, it's because the size of the activation records can be different. If the size of the activation record was always the same, then we wouldn't need a pointer to the previous one because we could just uh, um, jump a specific number of bytes uh, if we need to go to the previous activation record, given that they were they are all of the same size. But if the size is different, and it is because blocks can be different, then we need a pointer to the previous activation record, and Sometimes this is called a dynamic link or a control link. And the set of links uh, that we can travel through or the set of links implemented by these pointers is called the dynamic chain. So we could go from the current activation record to the previous one and then from that previous one to the previous one before and so on. So if we follow these dynamic links, we uh, we're basically going through a chain. We're traveling uh, uh, through a chain, chain, dynamic chain. Now, uh, so this was activation record for blocks, but we're also saying that we have activation records for procedures or functions. And what does that contain? Well, it's actually very similar to that of the inline blocks, but it has some additional information. So it has some, some more complications. So for example, uh, when we activate a procedure, it is necessary to store greater amount of inf information to, to manage the, con the control flow. One, one problem is, for example, to, to be able to go back to the uh, to the stay to to the code to the place in code where we were earlier before the call. So, if we go back to our example, uh, in the case of inline blocks, when this block has finished, we just execute the next statement. So that's no problem. But if we're calling a function, say here, when we call the function f inside main and the function f uh, finishes ex executing then we need to be able to uh, execute the next statement after the function call and that means that we need to record the address of that statement because when we call f we need to jump in the code to the 
to the machine code for f. So basically the program counter, which is usually a register, the program counter register stores the, the address of the next instruction. So when we are going to call the function f, we need to change the program counter and uh, jump to the code, to the machine code for the first statement in f. But once f has finished executing, we need to be able to jump back to the next instruction after uh, our call. So here, this is one of the complications that are different from blocks uh, versus procedures. Complications that have to do with the flow of control. And notice also that if in the case of a function, we might have a return value. So when the function has finished, the caller needs to be able to get the return value from the function. This is not something that we have to think about when we have, have, have blocks. So the activation records for, for procedures or functions is, uh, is larger than the one that we had for uh, blocks, but some information is, is really the same. So what do we have here? We have um, local variables and intermediate results. This is what we had for the blocks as well. And we have a dynamic chain pointer. And this is what we have for the blocks also. But now we have something called the static chain pointer, which we will discuss later. We have the return address. That's something that we already discussed. We have the address for the result in case it's a function call. And we have parameters because functions can have formal parameters, but blocks cannot have parameters. So you can see that the activation record for the uh, for procedures uh, is, uh, contains uh, um, more information than the activation record for blocks. We can really say that blocks is uh, the activation record for block. Blocks are, are, are a subset of the activation record for procedures uh, and functions. So what do we have inside the activation records for procedures and functions? Well, we said it earlier, intermediate results, local variables, dynamic chain pointer. This is just the same as for inline blocks. Then we have something called a static chain pointer, which is the necessary information for implementing static scope rules. That's something we will discuss a little bit later. We have discussed the return address, which is the, uh, the address of the first instruction to execute after the, the current function has terminated. Uh, in case we have functions, we need to store the return results. And this is often uh, stored in, inside the caller's activation record. So if we go back to our example, Let's say we have a function here that really returns a value, it returns int. So somewhere in our function f, there's a return y here. That means that when we call our function f, we might be doing something like this. a is equal to f of x. So when main is executing, it has its own activation record, and inside that activation record, so, so let me say it again, main is then the caller, main is the caller of the function f, f is called the callee, the one that is being called. So a is the caller, and inside the activation record for a, there is a, there is a, a space for the return value. So. Uh, re the return results and uh, there might be a inside the uh, inside the uh, activation record for f there might be a pointer to the memory location uh, where the the value is to be uh, stored so in our case the function f has a pointer to the 
a specific memory address inside the activation record for main. That would be one way of implementing it. Uh, and then finally we have here uh, parameters which are the values of the actual parameters used to call the procedural function. The actual parameters. So when we call the function f here with a actual parameter, uh, the function f needs to store that value somewhere. And in this case, because we're doing a call by a value here, uh, the, the formal parameter a will read receive the value of the actual parameter x here and that formal parameter a here is um, stored in the activation record for f. So as we saw earlier one of the uh, memory uh, part of the memory is for the parameters. So we have the local variables, intermediate result and the parameters. And we have talked about the address for result and we have talked about the dynamic chain pointer. We haven't talked about the static chain pointer, but we will do that later. And we have uh, discussed the return address as well.